Hello and welcome to episode 54 of the Live Fit Now podcast. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Vicky Brown and I am your host. If you haven't already, please do hit subscribe. It's a great way of supporting the podcast. And of course, if you can share it with your friends and family, that would really help spread the word. Now, today's episode is a conversation and I cannot wait for you to listen. It's such an interesting subject. So once you have, please do let me know what you think. Without further ado, here is the conversation. My guest today is an EFT tapping practitioner specializing in eating disorders and disordered eating with a background in movement and fitness. Her name is Emily Andrew of We Are Mind Body. Welcome to the Live Fit Now podcast, Um, Emily. Thank you for joining me today. How are you? For having me. Yeah, no, I'm really good. Thank you. Enjoying the sunshine. Lovely. Now, I always like to start the conversation of really just letting my guests tell me a little bit more about themselves what it is they do and and why they do it yeah so um yeah so I am an EFT practitioner um kind of been in this kind of wellness space if you like for over a decade now which makes me feel very old suddenly um I know the feeling (laughs) yeah suddenly you're just like oh my goodness um (laughs) But yeah, essentially, I I got into it because of my own struggles. Um, when I was 21, um, I was given a few months to live because I had an eating disorder. And um, I had always wanted to kind of, I was training to be an actress. I wanted to be in that kind of performance space. And it was a dream that I'd had since I was really young. And because of my eating disorder and various mental health issues that I was facing, my life just kind of took a redirect. And um, I I kind of went through a couple of rounds of of treatment and on one of them, when I kind of finally got through um, and was in recovery, I went to a gym and found a, looked at a Pilates class and I thought that looks really easy. It's just lying down on the floor. That's great. (laughs) And um, I, I ended up doing it, training on it, realizing it is not easy if you do it properly. Absolutely. Um, and it, that kind of was my first venture into kind of the space of wellness, because um, what I was really passionate about was how movement could affect our mental health in a positive way and how it could actually really help us when we're looking at navigating away from kind of damaging diet culture and, and that kind of element of it. But I always had a real interest in the way that our mind work, minds worked as well. So I started going down kind of the coaching route and a training as an eating disorder practitioner. And it was through that that I found EFT. And it's quite nice, really, because it was when I found EFT that I finally felt like I found my thing. And not only that, it was bringing everything that I'd learned together, you know, the body and the mind together and the way that that is so powerful when we are dealing with whether it is, you know, issues with food, issues with exercise, whether it is anxiety, depression, pain, phobias, all of these things, all of these challenges that we have and come across day to day, creating this kind of mind body connection with something like tapping is one of the most powerful things that I've experienced myself and also seen in a transformative way for the clients and the people that I work with so that was a mini nutshell hopefully (laughs) I kept that it was great and it it, I think it's even more powerful when you've been through something yourself because you know what it is capable of and then it gives you that passion to really want to share it with other other people I think perhaps it's a good moment to ask you if people are thinking what is EFT what is it what is it? So uh, EFT stands for Emotional Freedom Techniques, and it's been around in some form or another for about 50 years. But in its kind of EFT as we know it now, it was created by a guy or kind of reimagined by a guy called Gary Craig in the 90s. So it's been um, researched for about 20 years now, which is great because when it first came up, it was very much talked about and it is in the it's still in the bracket of energy psychology so uh what essentially it is is tapping on acupressure points of the body so face and upper body whilst using a um 
either a statement or some kind of cognitive intervention, whether that's exposure, whether that's reframing. And what happens when we tap on acupressure points, A, um, it, it helps to reduce any kind of distress in the body. So at the beginning, when it was first introduced, it was talked about as energy, which can really put some people off if mm. you know they're very logical minded. And although science is now catching up and we can you know say that everything is energy, we are all energy, it still doesn't really connect. Yeah. And when it first came out, it was very much about rebalancing energy in the body and energy imbalances in the body being a cause for emotional distress and physical illness. So the tapping element and the cognitive element kind of combined with that helped to rebalance it. Yeah. But now, because we've had 20 years worth of research, what we can say is this tapping on acupressure points, including with this cognitive element of it, helps to reduce any kind of overexertion or, or overactivation of the amygdala, which is our stress center of our brain. So when we get anxious, when we get stressed, our amygdala starts to fire off cortisol and all these kind of fight and flight hormones that we have. Our yeah. body will have a physical response to these hormones. And obviously our mind will also start to try and make sense of it. What the tapping uh, and the EFT does is to reduce that so that we can actually reduce any kind of physical and mental uh kind of outcomes of being overstimulated or that being activated and bring ourselves back to a place of real calmness and real clarity so it helps us to kind of get back to a nice neutral space where we can then choose the next step you know choose how we want to feel and, and become less um controlled by that that kind of activation yeah is this something that is always done to yourself or can it be done by a practitioner to you? So when it first started, it was very much practitioners tap on you. Uh, but then COVID came along and it's, you know, it, it's so, less common now to, especially then, because you had to work remotely, it was better for the person to tap on. Generally, when I work with clients, I always encourage them to tap on themselves because then it becomes a skill that they can utilize and learn without needing me. Yeah. So it's, it basically enables us to give people the power to be able to move through that. Yeah. So uh, getting people to tap on themselves is how I normally do it. But if somebody isn't able to tap on themselves, then of course you can tap on other people. Parents can use it with their children People can use it for um, people that kind of are later in, in life and don't have the ability or the range of movement. So it can be it's very accessible in a lot of different ways. Is this on the level of you know, something like meditation where most people would benefit from it from it, even though I imagine most people that will come to you because they're trying to deal with a particular you know potentially stressful issue but actually is it the sort of thing that would just make anyone feel just that little bit better and a little bit more calm yeah absolutely I think the thing with EFT is it's a tool yeah so it's a tool that can be utilized in lots of different ways so you've got what we call kind of emotional first aid which anyone can do which is when you're feeling particularly if you're if you're ha having a stressful day if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're anxious, uh, if you haven't, and it doesn't have to be in an extreme, but you can tap through the points, acknowledging how you feel and kind of reconnecting those feelings with your body and move through it. So it helps to kind of move through something. And then on a deeper level, what you may find when you're tapping, say, for example, if you, you were having, feeling really anxious one day, <clears throat> you would tap, you would tap the feeling down. But as you tap the feeling down, perhaps a memory might pop in. And this memory would be one of the core memories or experiences or reasons why that anxiety trigger is in place. So with the memory, you can work through memories on your own. But generally, if it is quite a distressing one, that's when you'd find a practitioner. And there are ways that you can work through a memory to be able to reduce it. So you've kind of got the two different layers of how deeply you work, but in terms of day-to-day, -day, 
you can definitely um, utilize it just to kind of further your well-being. And it's quite good for people that do struggle with meditation because it's an alternative to like bring yourself down. Yeah, but it kind of gives you a focus as well, doesn't it? Sometimes it's easier to focus on that thing rather than just thinking, I can't stop thinking. So it makes you feel like you're progressing potentially in something as well. Yeah, 100%. And um, you don't have to try and reframe it. So if you are um, tapping and you've got all these memories with, with meditation, sometimes there's such high expectations of opening your mind there's something which I love to teach my clients which is tap and rant and that's just basically tapping through the points and being like everything's gone wrong today I'm so stressed this person's really annoyed me just tapping through and just saying everything that's going through your head and what you find because of the the way that tapping works those things start to the intensity the feelings behind it the emotions behind it start to reduce and it enables you to kind of move forward throughout it. So it's really about acknowledging the truth of how you feel and then being able to move forward and through that. So if someone's thinking, hmm, I'm curious about that, how, you know, what do you think is the best way of trying? I mean, is there even a little thing you could go through now to sort of show us a, a brief example of how it works? Because I'm guessing you don't just start randomly tapping <laughs> yourself to get these these responses because you're going to need to know where the acupressure points are to start with yeah yeah and that is something that is important the the way that you tap uh where you tap is really important so uh when you tap you do need to find the actual points because they've done research where they've tapped on sham points so points that aren't thought to be acupressure points and the results are very different you won't get the same results if you're tapping on the wrong place that being said the order in which you tap the speed in which you tap and which side you tap doesn't matter okay because we've got it's based on the meridian system which are kind of channels lines through both sides of our body okay and the exciting thing about the meridian system is that science has started to actually prove that it's real which is was always a big barrier. Mm. So what we'll what we'll do, we'll do just a bit of a, a practice and I'll kind of talk you through it. So for anybody that's listening, if you're doing if you're doing anything like driving, perhaps don't close your eyes or anything like that. You can tap while you drive, but make sure that you are very much still present. You're not thinking, you know, you're focusing on the road. <clears throat> but what I'd like you to do is I'd like you just to take a minute just to check in on your breath okay so just don't try and do anything with it just notice how it feels for you to breathe okay so we rate things in tapping with in EFT so we know where we are so zero is I can breathe really freely really deeply and 10 is my breath feels really restricted really tight okay so just note where you are on that scale and then what we do is we acknowledge the problem that we have and create an acceptance around it with a setup statement. So in this case, we're going to focus on our breath. So we start by tapping on the side of the hand. So the side of your hand where your little finger is on that fleshy bit and on the side of the hand. Again, you can use two or three fingers. It doesn't matter. You can use either side. And you're going to say, even though. Even though. I have this restricted breath. I have this restricted breath. I choose to feel calm and relaxed. I choose to feel calm and relaxed. Even though. Even though. I have this restricted breath. I have this restricted breath. I choose to feel calm and relaxed. I choose to feel calm and relaxed. Even though. Even though. I have this restricted breath. I have this restricted breath. I choose to feel calm and relaxed. I choose to feel calm and relaxed. Okay, so that's our setup. We're going to go into a reminder statement now. So we're going to come to the beginning of your eyebrow. So where your eyebrow begins, either side, you can do both sides if you want to, and just tapping there, just at a kind of a pressure that feels comfortable. So it's not too hard, not too soft. And we're just going to say this restricted breath. 
this restricted breath. You're going to come round to the side of the eye. So where you're the side of your eye, this restricted breath. This restricted breath. You're going to come underneath the eye. So directly underneath the eye, this restricted breath. This restricted breath. We're going to come underneath the nose. This restricted breath. This restricted breath. We're going to come underneath the lip, so on the chin crease. This restricted breath. This restricted breath. We're going to come underneath the collarbone. So where your collarbones come towards each other, come together, got the little gap in between. So it doesn't matter which side, where your collarbone starts, about an inch below. I like to use more fingers here just to cover a bigger area. We're going to say this restricted breath. This restricted breath. We're going to come underneath the arm. So where you would wear a backpack strap or the beginning, the top of your bra line. This restricted breath. This restricted breath. And then we're going to come top of the head. This restricted breath. This restricted breath. Good. Take a breath in. Breathing out. Okay. And we're going to do one more round. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just following me, so eyebrow, my restricted breath. My restricted breath. Coming round to the side of the eye. There's something blocking my breathing. There's something blocking my breathing. Coming underneath the eye, stopping me from taking a full breath. Stopping me from taking a full breath. Coming underneath the nose, my restricted breath. My restricted breath underneath the lip this restricted breath this restricted breath underneath the collarbone any block to my breathing any block to my breathing coming underneath the arm stopping me from taking a full breath stopping me from taking a full breath top of the head my restricted breath my restricted breath Taking a breath in and breathing out. So normally we would stick with the truth of how we're feeling for a few more rounds, but yeah. just for sake of demonstration, we're going to read. Okay. So um, and back to the eyebrow and say any remaining restricted breath. Any remaining restricted breath. I mean to the side of the eye. Any block to my breathing. Any block to my breathing. Underneath the eye. Stopping me from taking a full breath. Stopping me from taking a full breath. Underneath the nose, any stress or tension that I'm feeling. Any stress or tension that I'm feeling. Underneath the lip, I give myself permission to let it go. I give myself permission to let it go. Coming underneath the collarbone, I choose to breathe freely and deeply. I choose to breathe freely and deeply. Coming underneath the arm, I choose to feel calm and relaxed. I choose to feel calm and relaxed. Coming to the top of the head, breathing deeply and feeling calm. Breathing deeply and feeling calm. Good, taking a breath in. Breathing out. Okay, and then just letting your hand rest onto your chest. And again, checking in with yourself, just notice how you feel. Notice if anything's changed. So sometimes that when we're working on an issue, it can kind of get worse before it gets better. That's absolutely normal. We just need to keep tapping through the points until we start to feel better. You can maybe reduce talking and just focus on breathing. Sometimes it stays the same. That might be because we haven't tapped for long enough. It hasn't been specific enough for you. Um, uh, it doesn't mean it doesn't work. It's just that it is just length of time or not specific. And then what you might also find, which we want to get to in the end, is for us to feel better. So in this case, we want our number to go closer to zero. So in that kind of very brief demonstration, what was your experience it, it, I did actually feel more relaxed, which is one of those things you think, oh, am I going to get it right? I've got to copy, I've got to do. But actually it was, there was definitely a, 
a slight sort of decompression by the end, mm -hmm. which was which is nice. Which brings me to my I have two questions that I was thinking, you know, that I thought of after that is is number one, how long would you do it for upon on average if you were if you were sort of trying to deal with the situation? And are the words vital or is it for some people at all that they just focus on the tapping tapping part of it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first question in terms of how long you do it for is very uh, individual. So some people, it depends, and it also depends on what you're working on. So if you were just using it as a way just to feel a bit more balanced in the morning, five minutes, is absolutely fine. Um, if you were working on a deeper issue, you might, you could tap for an hour, an hour and a half, not continuously, you would stop and kind of check in on how you feel. But essentially, there's no kind of magic number with it. So what we would do is if you were feeling stressed, for example, you tap on feeling stressed, tap on exactly how you feel. And when you do start to feel better, that's when you then change the wording. If you are speaking and be able to kind of reframe it into I'm feeling less stressed or allow yourself to feel calm and relaxed, etc. So that could take anything from kind of five minutes to 20 minutes if it's kind of just a, a, a basic uh it, it, one one singular emotion that you're feeling that you're experiencing um and it, it essentially it happens very quickly because of the way it works with the mind and with the body um if you are working on a deeper issue what they've found is that it is as effective if not more effective uh in results than cbt but in about half the time so if you were working on PTSD with CBT, you'd have 20 sessions of 50, 60 minutes. With EFT, you might have six to 10. Okay, so it's it's much shorter in, in terms of length of how long you'd you'd have to do it because of the way that it works with the body and the way that it it can it it's not like talking therapy where you have to drudge up every single detail of what's happened. There's lots of different ways to do it. So you don't, it doesn't re-traumatize. Okay. Um, in terms of whether the words are important, not really. Um, it's not like there's a magic set of words. No. It's, it's your truth. So this is something that I talk about a lot when I do my workshops is it's the truth of your experience right now that matters. So if you can connect to the truth of how you're feeling, whether that be by connecting into feelings that are going on in your body. So if we're anxious, how do we know we're anxious? Tight chest, can't breathe, tense shoulders, perhaps, this, this, uh, uh, kind of a funny tummy. Connect to those feelings and allow yourself to feel them while you're tapping. You don't have to describe them as such, but sometimes the words help us just to cognitively you know, say, and you might find yourself saying stuff that you wouldn't, you wouldn't have even done because we work really deeply with the subconscious mind. So it, it, it can be quite surprising when you do speak out loud. Um, but in terms of if it's vital for tapping to work, what they've actually found through the research is the, the two things that really matter is the actual tapping on the acupressure points and the acknowledging the truth of your, of, of how you feel. So whether you choose to use words or not, it is totally individual. The only thing I say with words is that it helps us to keep really present to the problem. If we're tapping and we're thinking about, you know, what we're going to cook for dinner tonight, for example, won't be as effective as if we were focusing in. Yeah. Is it a daily practice for you or do you just pull it out of your toolkit when you need it? So I tap every day um, because it just helps to you know when you when you work in in this way and with people as well it's really important that you do your own work on yourself so making sure that you are in the right kind of place to be able to hold space for others and um, so one part of that is definitely keeping that kind of cup full and tapping helps to do that um whether that be if I come up with some kind of a stress in my day or if it's actually working on a deeper level on a certain issue or belief. Um, I'm also a matrix re-imprinting practitioner, which is like a side arm of EFT, but that works really deeply in the subconscious with things like beliefs. 
so uh, I might I might kind of do a very long session on that for myself yeah. um is because, that a yeah, form of coaching or is that a physical element to, to that as well to sorry to make matrix, the matrix yeah the matrix reimprinting is basically a sidearm of um EFT it's very fascinating um it sounds a bit more woo woo than EFT because there's you know you can always fall back on the research with EFT yeah, yeah. but essentially it's what it helps us to do is um say for example with with EFT if you were tapping on something and a memory popped up there are lots of different ways to work with that memory but generally we would just tap by watching the memory and helping ourselves to become de-traumatized or um, helping to remove the emotion from the memory so that we can move forward with matrix for imprinting what you do is you step into the memory and you see what we call an echo which is basically the version of yourself that kind of got stuck when the traumatic thing or the decision or the belief happened and you would tap on the echo so if we were working together we would be tapping together but you would be stepping into the memory and tapping on a younger or a previous version of Victoria to be able to help to and de-traumatize that echo and help them to move on because essentially these echoes these kind of versions of ourselves that get stuck are constantly repeating the same behaviors over and over and over again so when we're looking any kind of change work whether that is moving past some kind of an addiction or a a, a kind of a mental pattern that we go through if there is a part of us that still feels scared or stuck because of what has happened to us previously there's only so much that motivation or willpower or habit will get us to we need to make sure that we feel safe and we've kind of helped that kind of that previous version of us to move forward so some people would liken it to kind of inner child work. Yeah, that's um, what popped into it, my head when you said it. Yeah, yeah, but it isn't. Um, it doesn't have to be a child version of us. We can be. We can have a kind of fight, flight, freeze. Yeah, at any. It could be of. last year that you know. It could be relatively recently. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Uh, and do you do you think if if people are curious? how is the best way to start to do tapping? I mean, I think you mentioned workshops. I mean, are there group settings to do it? Is it something you're probably better to learn one-on-one to then be able to take on? Or are you just more about whichever way is more accessible to you, go for that? Yeah, I mean, I'm always going to go for that last option because I think that's really important. But there's a lot of tapping online. So you can learn the basic kind of I, I I tend to stick with clinical EFT which is basically just what the research um comes up with if you tap on one point that's fine you know there are other ways to do it, it doesn't mean it's not going to work but with clinical EFT there's a route and also once you rem- kind of get into that route then you can kind of it's there some yeah. people that yeah. I work with don't like going underneath the arm it's uncomfortable to get to so we skip it, it doesn't mean it's not going to work um so I think learning the basics of EFT, you can do online, but just make sure that you're learning it from somebody who is a practitioner, who has, you know, they're, they're an associate member of some kind of organization, just as you would with a personal trainer, you want to make sure that they have got the correct qualifications. They haven't just learned it and are kind of making it up. Making it up. <laughs> um, and um so kind of learning the basics and applying it into your life is a really great start. There's lots of different ways to do it. So I'm starting to run tapping circles online, which is basically where a group of us will get together and you can bring in an issue or you might just come and choose to tap along and kind of collectively work together on certain issues. Um, you can do that in person as well. There's lots of different events for that. Um, and then if you anything kind of pops up it's about being able to then reach out to a practitioner so you're not just dealing with it on your own the the thing with EFT is there is always a choice of what you work on so if you were tapping on something and something distressing will pop up you don't have to go into it then you can pop a pin in it or put it on the moon and you can keep it up there until you want to bring it down and work on it and if you choose not to do that that's absolutely your 
um, you're right. So I don't I don't believe in the you have to if you're not ready to deep right into the depths of all the darkest places you've ever been in in order to heal. I think that that can be really um, an unhelpful way of of looking at healing and growth and that kind of area of things. Um, so, you know, but it is about knowing that if anything does come up, you have somebody that you can reach out to, whether it's somebody, a practitioner you've worked with or um, somebody that you kind of respect in the field so that you can just say, look, this has happened. I don't know how to navigate it. And generally what they do, they think that if I have to, they can kind of set up a, a, an appointment with them and you can work through it in that, in that kind of area. Yeah, that makes All workshops sense. As well. Workshops is also a great way of accessing yeah. it. So I've done workshops for Macmillan Cancer Charity. I've gone and tapped with some of their um, kind of professional volunteers. So I have oh, doctors wow. and nurses and physios and yoga teachers um all learning tapping i've worked with insurance companies that have got me into their well-being kind of thing i've gone to festivals and that's a really accessible way of learning more about tapping and learning the basics and then you can bring it into your everyday it kind of allows you to be curious doesn't it i mean if you were, if you were to say what people are you most passionate about helping like i think you know, we all we all get drawn towards you know different kinds of people and I guess they're drawn to us as well. Have you got a passion point about it or do you just want everyone to know how good tapping can actually be? So I I guess it's kind of multi-layered. I I do want to make this tool accessible for everybody because I think that it is something that everybody can benefit from, no matter what age, no matter where, what kind of financial security place they're in. But my passion is really about those people that feel stuck those people that are limited by the the way that they think about themselves or the way that they think about life and feel like they can't change or they you know it isn't possible for them to be a, a different version of themselves um because being stuck is one of the hardest parts to be in because we know what we want to do but we can't quite do it And sometimes we just need somebody to witness us in that space to be able to allow us to start to accept exactly where we are and then choose to step forward from that. Um, People that struggle with their relationship with food will always be a very special um, part of the work that I do because of what I've been through and how passionate I am. But really at the root of that, it is the beliefs and the the stuckness because I lived for 22 years with the belief of I'm not good enough and I'm not the only person that believes that or believed that but because I've been there and I I know that it's possible to think differently and do the work and it doesn't always have to be horrible no. that's you know that's that's the magic of it um so yeah, I I I am somebody. I just am very passionate about people, and yeah, um, that's, that's that's me. Yeah, no, it makes sense, and I, that absolutely comes across. And it there was always a phrase that um, one of the senior teachers at school said, "It's like, don't hold yourself back with self-imposed limitations." And I think even some of the most successful people they hold themselves back by something. I think there's always something within us that we don't necessarily believe in ourselves, even if others do. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I can just, I can see how anyone would benefit from trying because we, we all have our own narrative in our in our heads and we do allow that to, to hold us back sometimes. Yeah, and I think some of the most powerful work that we can do is acknowledging that and and moving through that because when we rise we empower other people to rise you know and and it is that on a collective level it's not us versus them it is you know being able to to transform and and lift other people with us you know just because you shine brightly it doesn't mean you dull anybody else in fact you magnify them and I think that that's something that gets lost sometimes because we are we're in a competitive world and it Mm -hmm. can sometimes feel like there isn't enough or there isn't, you know, there isn't 
the ability to do all the things and be all the things because we think but they're already doing it yeah. actually no it's it's about lifting everybody together and, and understanding that people take different rates and that's absolutely fine yeah and and you know it, it's just, as you say there's there's a lot you, you look at something and you think oh, there's so many people doing the same thing but it isn't quite like that because actually you we all connect with different people people can you know three different people could tell you the same thing but one you actually hear mm -hmm. and that's what it's about and you want to just build that community where there's as many tools on the table as possible so that the day we need it we can we can access it mm. and i'm guessing that is why the eft tapping is is at the forefront of what you do because obviously you've got a lot of a lot of skills and you've got a lot of certificates and qualifications but i can really sense that that is a real passion of being the accessible tool that can help so many people mm, yeah and that's i think that's why it it suddenly i felt like i came home to myself when i learned eft and there were so many barriers because when i when i first learned about it it was kind of this spiritual thing and at the time i was like i'm not spiritual i used to call myself spiritually dense i was like i don't <laughs> get it not it's yeah. not me and I had to learn the research behind EFT I had to understand how it worked before I could really start to believe it and I and I and I did that I went and researched loads of stuff and I was like okay there's something in this and um I you have to do a certain amount of hours with clients and every single one I had was like oof you know the the depth of some of the stuff that I worked with on people um, and some of which I didn't know, you know, I, I had a, a woman that I worked with who had gone through a very, very awful experience and I didn't know the details. I didn't know what had happened. I knew that somebody had died, but that was it. And it wasn't until the end of the session where she was able, actually able to talk about that. And not only was she able to talk about it, she had forgiven herself for what had happened. She had found peace. She had found clarity in, in the, in the work, in the, the bits that we'd worked on and I saw those kind of transformations again and again and again and again and I was like this is something you know and and it's yeah. it's true it's about finding what works for you some people will look at me or listen to me and be like nah don't like her she annoys me you know she's a little bit strange a bit too ginger whatever it is <laughs> and and that's fine and that's really that's absolutely fine maybe they'd go and they'd find somebody else who was also big in the tapping world and it would land for them and it would be accessible for them. And that's great. Yeah. And I think that's when we take away the ego, you know, and actually if they, it, 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 it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if somebody doesn't access it with me or not, if they access it with somebody else, that's great. And if they access it and they go, you know what, this isn't for me, I prefer breath work or I prefer meditation or I, and then that's cool too, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's just about being about... open-minded, isn't it? And just having yeah. a go. I think that's the thing, you know, I think um, I've covered a lot of holistic topics on the podcast and that comes from the fact that one, lots of science is now starting to, uh, <laughs> hello, uh, is, is starting to back up these things that people have been saying, this works, you know, for years and years. Um, um, and often it comes from situations where, you know, often a health issue will come up or there is an issue and you just reach the point where you're going to try anything because you want it to get better. And it's in those moments that you realize there are so many opportunities to try things and they may not always work. Sometimes they don't work for one person, but then they are the magic for someone else. And it's just sort of allowing yourself to be open minded enough to see if there are some things out there that can truly transform your life and when you were describing that story it just made me made me think it gives the it gives the chance of freedom like freedom from being in your trauma or you know trapped in those thoughts or just even not facing it and I think a lot of pe people need to feel that freedom yeah yeah 100 percent. I think that that's something that we don't we we don't consider ourselves trapped a lot of the time when we are you know we just identify as I'm an anxious person or I can't do this or it's I are it's very I based and the beliefs come in there like I am this or I 
can't do this. And actually that's in itself is a version of feeling trapped or being trapped. But when we can, when we can create, create space and kind of take it's, take that kind of emotion away from it, the negativity, the, the kind of the blocks in that, then we can choose actually, does that, does that work for me? Does this belief, does this feeling, does this, this emotion actually work for me? Do I want to keep it or do I want to maybe look at, at reframing or changing it? And, and that's, that's the thing. And, you know, I have come from a very skeptical place, extremely skeptical place. I, I, tried to dip my toe into kind of understanding of the, about the universe and all of this stuff way like way back yeah and I just didn't really get it then and I actually went to a medium this was when I was like I think it was before I got married so it must have been 20 at when I was 24 so I'm 32 now so it was a while ago and um I was like I'll go to a medium and I had an amazing session with this medium but the medium said you're gonna work with something to do with the meridians and I didn't understand what a meridian was, had no idea, never heard of it before, forgot about it and left it there, got more sceptical, got really annoyed by people who were kind of, you know, oh, just do this and, and meditate and breathe. I was like, no, no, no. And obviously over time and stuff, I, I kind of came back to EFT and didn't really know much about it, signed up to the course because I was like, there's something here, want to understand about it did the first thing was a bit still a bit like mm, not sure started doing the research and then meridians came up and I was like huh okay this is interesting because by that time I had started to really like feel at home I felt like this is this is in this is for me and that was just a lovely full circle moment of being open to being really skeptical to being open again and kind of coming back to myself and and make it like choosing to change my mind which sometimes we don't let ourselves do we we kind yeah. of poke ourselves up to a, a flagpole and go this is me and I will not change <laughs> yes we've got to allow and ourselves I'm, to evolve evolve yeah yeah and I'm a Taurus so it's very easy for me to be very stubborn <laughs> what I love about that that makes you even more relatable because actually you know people are often skeptics and the fact that you have come from that point and now are as passionate as you are is, I think, going to make far more people more inclined to at least give it a go. And that's ultimately all you can can hope for, isn't it? For people to give it a go and then hopefully they'll feel the benefits for themselves and they won't need any further convincing. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a question I always like to ask everyone. We may have brushed on a few things already, but are there any common myths linked to anything that you do it doesn't necessarily have to be um EFT specific that you would like to debunk oh gosh where do I start <laughs> <laughs> um so I guess one of the the main ones with tapping because it has become a bit of a it has started to blow up a little bit with especially online you've got a lot of people doing tapping online and a lot of the time um, when you see tapping, so it was all, if anyone watched I'm a Celebrity and with Boy George in it, they would have seen him tapping, yeah. saying, I'm calm, I am connected, I am a really rich man, whatever, whatever. <laughs> it was. Um, so what he was doing there, and, and you see a lot of that online. So you'll see a lot of people tapping on positive things. Okay. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. There, there is definitely a place for that. But that kind of comes after the reason why you see that online because you've got to keep people safe as a practitioner yeah. you know you've got to make sure that you somebody isn't following along with you and something really distressing comes up that they can't cope with because you're not in the room with them okay yeah. so the, that's the reason why you see a lot of just positive tapping or affirmation tapping and that will help in terms of the actual stimulation of the acupressure points is going to help to calm you down and you might find a real benefit from that. But a lot of people will follow a video online and go, I've tried tapping, it doesn't work for me. But that's because it hasn't been specific and it isn't the truth of how you're feeling. So if you're tapping on, I am calm, I am relaxed, and you're having a panic attack, that's not going to land very well because your body's like, no, I'm having a panic attack. Yeah. So being able to um, 
tap on the truth, which is generally the negative, that's real EFT. That's kind of what the core of EFT. The positive stuff might come later. Um, equally, if you've done, if you tap quite a lot, you could start your day with positive tapping. And that's a great way of starting your day. Like I'm going to have a really good day. Everything's going to go my way. All of that kind of thing. And um, there is definitely place for it. But if you are looking at getting at working on emotional issues, um, physical pain, phobias, PTSD, um, that kind of thing, then that is something to um, to really kind of take note of as well. Um, so that would be one of the, the most common myths with tapping is that it's just tapping uh, and the other one I guess which is smaller is that it's a distraction technique um it is not a distraction technique because it actually as I just mentioned we focus on the truth of how we're feeling so actually we're not distracting from it we're processing it yeah or if anything you're bringing it out so you're certainly not just trying to hide it away it's sort of the opposite yeah yeah um and following on from that is there what what are the biggest challenges that you have found in your work in in helping and educating in people to to try tapping? Um, I think because I don't connect myself to the outcome when I'm doing a workshop, it's not my job to convince anybody. I don't see it as a challenge if somebody doesn't get on with tapping. So um, at a recent festival, I had somebody come to a workshop that I did and he he was really lovely. We had a really nice conversation afterwards, but he basically was like, "I don't know if I'm convinced." And I was like, "That's cool. You, I'm not. I'm not here to convince you. Um, you know, if you found it interesting, that's great. You might forget about it for a few years. You may never return to it. You may return to it. That's absolutely fine. Um, I think sometimes people expect me to. I'm passionate about EFT, but I'm not going to shove it down somebody's throat because you have to be ready for it um so if it doesn't work for somebody I might ask questions like were you tapping as a group were you watching a video why do you feel it didn't work for you but at the end of the day it's not my um job to convince anybody yeah. whether it works or not I will give information I'm really I love people that are a bit skeptical because I was skeptical <laughs> You know, so, the stuff that needs to be shared to potentially convince you. Yeah, because yeah. you went through that journey yourself. Yeah, but equally, you know, if somebody doesn't want to believe that it works or isn't ready to try it, then that's absolutely cool. Yeah. Um, because that's their prerogative. Absolutely. With anything, you know, even if you may be able to see that lots of people need help, but if they're not open to help, you can't help them. You can only help them when someone's ready for it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think as well, people need to be ready to take that step to be able to help themselves. You know, I'm it's as much as I I care and I love working with people. I, I'm not going to be saving anybody. I'm giving them the tools to save themselves if they feel they need saving. But if it's just a case of they they want to grow I give them the tools to grow, you know, the the idea that we are broken and we need to be fixed, I think, is one that's very common. But I think that idea of being broken comes from an idea of fear. And actually, we just need to meet ourselves where we're at, no matter whether we think of it's a positive or a negative place, and choose whichever step is the next step. And if it helps us to get into a better place, whether wherever we're at, then brilliant. But we're not inherently broken. No. Therefore, we never need to be fixed. I think so. There's, there's so many aspects of lifestyle that there is sort of this desperation to put either a good or a bad tag on it. And sometimes it's just, it just is, it's just a thing. It is what it is. You're, you're feeling how you're feeling. It's not good or bad. It's just truth. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's quite where we're at yet. And I think when you can just be more accepting of things rather than feeling guilty because something is you're associating it as being bad or pleased because you think it's good, there's probably a, a, a path of neutrality there that can just help you face things that happen rather than feeling like it's sending you one way or the other. 
Yeah. And I think it's the motivation. Like when I first started, my whole ethos was you'll never hate yourself into a body that you love. You know, if you hate, you're, you're doing things because you hate the way that you are. So you're exercising, you're doing all the things that are quote unquote healthy for you. If you're coming from a negative place, the result's never going to be very positive. Yeah. You know, you're never going to get to that point. And I think that's the same whenever you're working with your mental health or your spiritual health or, you know, just your your relationship with yourself. If you're coming at it from a negative place because you feel like you're broken or because you, 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 you're, you're running or that it's a fear based decision that you're making, then we're not we're not kind of allowing ourselves to sit in that uncomfort, that discomfort because and accept before we take that next step because when we can do that we realize that every it is okay to feel these like we are humans we have been given all of these emotions and for for a reason you know it, we we were meant to feel in multicolor and sometimes that's really hard you know it's really hard to feel deeply sad or scared or anxious that's that's not an easy thing to go through but we but but being able to feel that entire kind of spectrum of emotions is part of being human so it's actually instead of being how can I run away from this I don't want to feel this it's how can I manage it when I am feeling like that and how can I quickly get myself back to a place of equilibrium exactly it's about moving through it isn't it it's like I think all emotions can be good for us if we don't stay in it for too long yeah and and that's the thing with the FT it's it gives you the choice of how long you want to stay with something for yeah that makes sense I don't see why everyone wouldn't want to try it now (laughs) so one of my favorite questions to ask everybody and I I actually think you've already almost told us the answer but I like to answer it as the question what inspires you oh what inspires me just I think just people I'm really I just I really am passionate about people and about just transcending limitations in general, because I think that that is something that is, you know, when when we're able to understand the limits that we have either been given or we've kind of brought in on ourselves, not for any fault of ours, but just from things that we've learned when we're able to acknowledge that we then understand that we have the power to change that and I really believe that we do have so much more power to be able to shape what our life looks like than than we believe is possible so being able to kind of help to break those boundaries and transcend those limitations is something that I am that kind of gets me all excited Love that. And mm. as we as we just sort of start drawing drawing it to a close, I, if there was just one thing that you think everyone would benefit from knowing, what would it be? I think it would just be that in our essence, when we really boil it down to everything, we are already perfect as we are you know in our imperfect ways in in you know we're we're here to be able to to understand to learn and to grow but even with all that stuff two things can be true at the same time and and in our essence we we are we're perfect we're 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 made to be as we are and when we can kind of sit with that and reconnect with ourselves and connect with that kind of that that love essentially that we're made up of that's that's something that I think is a really important thing to remember is that it's really really good to acknowledge that we're perfectly imperfect and you know it's it we're all it we're all just kind of walking each other home that is such a wonderful thought to bring that to a close and after that I have no doubt that people listening are going to want to find you on the internet where is the best place to come and find you so the best place to come and find me is i'm on well i'm on most things actually um 
they look up we are mind body um i'm on instagram i'm on tiktok um i have various ways of working with me i've got kind of a couple of different memberships that are one's just a tapping one one's pilates and bar um and then i've got workshops that run online and in person um tapping circles and of course like one-to-one work if anybody wants to kind of really work on a deep deep change level um or just want a one-off session to really understand how they can make tapping work in their own life um but yeah i'm I'm pretty much about about there here there and everywhere i will pop all the links on the show notes so people can click through and and find you thank you so much i have absolutely love this conversation because I wanted to know more about it and you have passionately shared and I feel like I now have more of an idea and want to know more so so thank you very much for your time oh fab well thanks so much for having me I really enjoyed it thank you so much for listening to this episode of the live fit now podcast I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed making it I would love to hear from you so don't forget you can get in touch through social media clicking through the links in the show notes or email me directly hello at livefitnow.co.uk until the next time